Joining us now, he's been the head coach at Alabama since 1999. He's been obviously with the program since 1997. He has 1,238 wins. Of course, 14 Women's College World Series appearances, a national champion, six SEC regular season titles, five SEC tournament titles. He's an NFCA Hall of Famer, an Alabama Sports Hall of Famer. I speak of Coach Patrick Murphy joining us here on In the Circle. That's a good resume there. That's how you doing. Hey, thanks for the introduction. I really appreciate it. And I do want to say, you know, one thing, thank you for what you do for softball because you're a tremendous uh, positive advocate for our sport. And I can't thank you enough for that. So everything that you do for everybody, it trickles down to all levels. So thank you, Eric. That means a lot. And, and I want to ask you what I just said, NFCA Hall of Famer and Alabama Sports Hall of Fame. I know, you know, it's a lot about your players and the success, but what does that mean that you've been honored in your career while you're still going? You're still going at your peak. You're coming off a College World Series appearance, but honored by two, by the NFCA and by the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame. What has that been meant to you? Well, you know, when we, when I got into the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame, May of 22, and we went over there, uh, we had played Missouri at home and we, Thank goodness Missouri had said yes, that we could play a little earlier because the ceremony was starting at 6.30. So we had to go to Birmingham. And so we started the game at noon and we're racing over there. And all the other inductees that year, it was NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball and me. And uh, some of them didn't know that I was still coaching. <laughs> they were all retired, you know. <laughs> So one of them said something and I said, yeah, thank goodness we won today. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, we played, we played Missouri today. And he goes, you're still coaching. And I said, yes, sir. So it's just, it's a really cool thing, you know, and, and this year it's the 40th anniversary of the NFCA, which is a, a great organization for softball coaches everywhere. And uh, they're doing a huge uh, thing at the opening um, segment of the convention next week. Louisville and it, they're bringing back all the past presidents and I, I, I'm one of them and one of the questions they're asking all of us is you know tell us about you know when you were the president what things were like and all this and I mean it just just to look back on the sport and to see the growth is just incredible because Eric I think I've I coached at Louisiana Lafayette for five years I coached at Northwest Missouri State for a semester I was an interim coach and then this is year 28 at Alabama. So it's like 34, 35 years in the sport. It's just unbelievable to see how far we've come. You mentioned that NFCA, obviously meeting there. What is that going to be? What's that like? I know the Lonnie Alameda will be inducted into the Hall of Fame, but do you? I know coaches, you all get to talk about topics. Do you, do you have a sense of what's going to be a hot topic uh, when you get to Louisville? Well, I mean, obviously transfer portal, NIL, um, that again, that's, you know, one thing that we really have to be careful with is we have to continue the pace of our game and it needs to go fast. And I know some people are like, wait a minute, it's already a fast game. But, you know, when you look at, uh, TV windows, um, the best time for our sport is a two hour window. So all kinds of things have to happen for that two hour window to stay, you know, 120 minutes. And uh, I'm sure that's going to be on an agenda somewhere, um, you know, but just still grow the game. And I think one of the biggest things, biggest ways to do it is when they announced that softball will be back in the Olympics in 28 in L.A. And it's unfortunate we're not in France or Paris this this or in 2024. But now you get an opportunity to just start blitzing the heck out of the public and saying that softball and baseball are back in 2028 and really, you know, grow the sport again because it's going to be a big deal because it's obviously we're the host country as well. No doubt. And that's huge. And obviously you've got players like Montana Fouts and Haley McClenny who's on the U S national team having a great year winning the Pan American games. And you took your team to Italy uh, this past summer, which I think was significant because we've had Michelle Smith on and she's talked about one of the keys to keeping softball in the Olympics consistently is growing the game in Europe. 
I'm curious. Let's start with that. You spending time in Italy. What is that like? Because that's that's one of the places there that certainly needs the growth in the sport. But what was that experience like? Oh, unbelievable. I think it's honestly, it's probably the best thing that we do as a program. This is our third trip. The Netherlands in 14, Japan in 18, and then Italy this past summer. And we raise all the money ourselves. It's about a $200,000 trip. Um, this was the first time uh, we went from three different cities where we stayed. It's usually we stayed at one city and we kind of have a host hotel. But there were so many things to see and do in Italy that we decided we'd play uh, Team Italy at the very beginning of the tour and then kind of move our way across the northern part of the country. And, you know, this is an opportunity for the 22 young ladies to uh, travel to Italy, play softball, and then tour a country that's unbelievable with their best friend. You just cannot, I don't think you cannot understate the benefit of traveling abroad because you get out of your comfort zone and you get into somebody else's country and their ways of doing things and their way of eating and their food and everything. And it's just an unbelievable opportunity. And, you know, I got to bring my secretary who's been with us for 23 years, my equipment manager, my SID, my strength coach, my nutrition person. You know, all these people that do so many things for our program that never really get thanked in a proper way, they got a free trip to Italy this summer and it, it fills their bucket, you know, and that's what you want is a you want support people to feel needed, wanted, but most of all appreciated. And I hope they all felt really appreciated by the end of the trip. Obviously, I know a big part because I've talked to you in the past about these similar trips you've had in the past. It's about the development of your team that bond the bonding the chemistry within your team so i know that's a big part but i'm wondering too how much do you talk to your players about hey this is you you help you're helping grow the game uh kind of like you do at your home games you're number one in attendance there's every year i'm sure there's casual people that come out to the the roads house for the first time and get hooked on the sport to because they watch your team do you talk to your players about that absolutely and you know we the I think the second day that we played Italy, there was probably 250 people in the stands and probably 50, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old girls. And it was all these young ladies that want to play for team Italy at one point and very cool. And, you know, after the game was over, they all brought their softballs around our kids. And I was like, okay, we, we're going to take as much time as we, we need to make sure every, every kid gets an autograph or, you know, a high five or whatever. Uh, it, it is huge, you know, and there was uh, a couple Italians that were huge Alabama fans that had, were head to toe, crimson and white, which was cool to see. Um, but just going over there and playing, you know, the national team of Italy, uh, it's a huge deal for them. It was a huge deal for us. And I, hopefully it's big for the sport because, you know, next year they're hosting the world championships yeah. in Italy. And, um, man, I'd, I'd love to go over just to watch because they, they have a really nice facility. Uh, it's going to be a great event. Um, obviously, uh, it's up near uh, Venice where they're going to play. So you can do a two for one. You can see the country of Italy and watch uh, world class softball at the same time. I was going to say, that's not a bad deal. I, I think I think that's a good deal there. And you get to see some great players play. Uh, like probably hopeful at Montana Fouts and a Haley McClinney. What's it like every time you see them representing the red, white, and blue together? Oh, it's unbelievable. And, you know, that's the highest honor you can get as a softball athlete, without a doubt. And, you know, they, they played great in um, Chile at the Pan Am Games. Obviously, just run through that tournament. Um, I just, you know, whatever happens, you know, it's not a guarantee by any means, you know, in 28, because they still, both of them have to work their butts off to make a team because there's hundreds of other young ladies that want that same honor, privilege, but you can't beat those two as representatives of a sport in the country. Um, just great young ladies and uh, they know what it's all about. McClenny is, I think, regarded arguably as pound for pound the best player in the world. I mean, even going back to the last Olympics in Tokyo, I think everybody agreed she was the best player on the field. Did you see that in her when she arrived at Alabama at, at some point that she would have the career that she is having? Well, you know, at the beginning, she had huge talent, 
but the thing that set her apart from everybody else, she was the hardest worker. So her trajectory just went through the roof. It didn't flatline, which a lot of kids, you know, they get to college on their talent, but then that's all they do. And they flatline. And you see that in every sport. You know, you wonder why a kid doesn't, you know, succeed at the collegiate level where I, some of them are just happy to be there. Uh, she was not that way. She continually asked us how to get better, make her better. What can she do? Um, the whole thing. Every year she got better. And obviously, you know, now, and I agree with you, Eric, she hit over 500 in the Olympics. And if you can do that, you're probably the best player in the world. And obviously nothing hits the ground in center field. She's a great leader. I mean, everybody respects the hell out of her. Um, you couldn't ask for anybody, you know, better to represent a country, to lead off for Team USA. Uh, she's the entire package. How strange is it to have a fall and not have Montana Fouts in your dugout? What has that adjustment been like for you? Really weird. <laughs> <laughs> she, she got to come back twice. Uh, she spoke at our, um, it's called the Bryant Society. And it's a dinner. It's a huge banquet where if you give a million dollars to athletics, they induct you into the Bryant Society. And it's an uh, incredible honor. And obviously, we're very, very thankful for those people that are inducted because that's a, a major commitment to athletics. But she was the student athlete that gave the thank you to every one of those donors this year. And she was the first female athlete asked to do that. So it was just incredible to see her up on the stage. And she was awesome. You know, and not only does she represent my team, but she represents every softball athlete when she when somebody does something like that, because they're going to look at her and say, wow, that's pretty cool. She was a softball pitcher at Alabama and look at her up there. Um, and then she came back to get her Honda Award uh, for softball. So uh, we miss her. Um, you know, I think she's just going to keep getting better and better. But, you know, we have uh, six pitchers on staff. It's the most we've ever had. Two of the six are also hitting. Um, so there's variety. We have a lefty and five righties and everybody's different. And that's kind of what Lance was hoping for, uh, a variety in the pitching staff. Uh, if you have four of the same, your scouting is pretty easy. You know, it's either up or down or whatever. But uh, the six that we have, everybody's completely different, uh, different speeds, different pitches, uh, and a different look. So it's, it was a fun fall. Um, we had uh, seven newbies on the team. Uh, so it was a, you know, get to know each other kind of fall. But um, I was really pleased with everybody. You mentioned the pitchers. You got Kayla Beaver, obviously, from Central Arkansas. You've got the youngster Jocelyn Brisky, who I know you've talked about very highly, in the even going back to the World Series press conferences. Just talk about your pitchers like Beaver and a Brisky. You got a little bit of everything, as you mentioned, the variety and the staff, but kind of that growth that you hope from them and the opportunity that's in front of them. Well, Brisky, I brought, I'm glad you brought her up because, you know, the one of the coolest things, the freshmen are allowed to come with us to Italy, but they don't have to because, you know, they're, they're playing summer ball. But they were told way in advance, you know, hey, this is an opportunity. If you'd like to come, I'd love to have you. And she chose to come with us, and so did Lauren, Lauren Johnson, uh, played for the Fury in Tennessee. And Eric, it's the best thing that they could have done. They got indoctrinated into the program. They got, they got to work with the strength coach. They got to have practices before we left. And then they got to take an 11 day road trip with their future team. And so when they came back in August for the first, first day of school, it was no big deal. You know, I've been here, I've done that. I know everybody and it wasn't a shock to the system. So it was just, the whole thing worked out really well. Uh, she also beat Italy the summer. Um, She's very, very, very mature, um, just way wise beyond her years. Work at this. Very I'm, I'm really pleased that she's going to wear crimson and white. Um, so I hope, hopefully, all those good things are going to translate to success on the, on the field. But you and I both know that every pitcher that comes to college, it's a difficult transition. Sure. Everybody, Pat Osterman, Monica Abbott. Stephanie Van Brakel, Montana Fouts, you name it. It's a whole different game. 
And the kids that can adjust and deal with getting hit quickest are the ones that, you know, in the end are the ones that are going to be standing at the World Series. Offensively, there's obviously so much intrigue with the returners you have, the new faces you have, and then, of course, the new faces you have on your staff that will be helping running the offense. Let's start with the players. What jumps out from your offense? Obviously, return players like Janet Johnson, Larissa, and Kaylee Callahan, but you also have new faces like a Riley Valentine and a Kendall Clark, and, and etc. Just talk about the off from an offensive standpoint and what you're looking at. Well, we hired uh, Adam Arbor. He was my volunteer coach when we won the World Series. Uh, he was uh, Amanda Chittister's basically hitting coach when she was on the road to the Olympics. Uh, the young lady from Michigan that was a hell of a hitter. And um, he's been just terrific all fall. And it, it was a new voice and a singular voice. And that really helped everybody. Um, but offensively, I was really pleased with everybody. And a name we didn't say was Bailey Dowling. Uh, probably from July 10th through today, November 30th. She was our most consistent hitter uh, all fall, just day in and day out, barrel all day long. Uh, really, really good. Kinley Kahalen, our uh, sophomore shortstop, mm -hmm. she was unbelievable in Italy. Everything she hit, Eric, was a line drive. It was either double or a triple. And you know, international fences are 220 all the way around. So she hit the bottom of the fence and the middle of the fence uh, on a line drive several times. Um, Jenna Johnson hit one of her longest home runs of her career against Italy. Um, and I think she's going to have a really good year. Uh, up and down, though, we're going to have new people. We have veterans. You know, we have nine seniors on the roster. So it's, pro it's the, by far, it's the most seniors we've ever had in the history of our program. Um, a young lady, Emma Broadfoot, senior, uh, she had a really good fall. Um, just everywhere you look, there's a pretty good athlete. Uh, and you mentioned Larissa Pruitt. She was just terrific for us at the end of the, the year last year. Second team all ICC as a freshman. Uh, I think she's getting better. Kristen White uh, led off for us a lot. Um, she has no clue how good she could be in the leadoff spot. The fastest kid on the team, probably the best athlete on the team. Uh, lefty Lefty probably has the best arm on the team as well. So she's when she realizes what she has as an athlete, she could be a Brittany Rogers, Caleb Rowe type of leadoff hitter for us. I agree with you on what I saw her up close uh, in Clearwater last season. I was blown away uh, by her. Is that one of those things where as a coach you have to be patient because every player it figures it out at their own timetable? Is that one of those where you just got to remind yourself, just be patient, it's going to come, it's going to come? Or what, you know, what, how do you kind of get the most out of a player like that? Well, you know, we had a, our end of the semester meetings and um, we reiterated all that to her. It's like, you know, our strength coach just raves about her in the weight room, you know, by far the best athlete, you know, right? Every, anything that they do jumps and sprints and all this stuff. And she's always at the top of the list. And they, she keeps track of everything in the weight room. And Kristen is at the top one, two or three in every category. So a kid really doesn't believe that she can do it until she does it. Like we can see it, but until she literally does it on the field, it, she, it's hard to have belief without evidence, right? I have it. Our strength coach has it. Our coaches have it. But as a young athlete, you got to have a little evidence behind all that talk, right? And it, you're right. It's, it comes with experience. It comes with doing it. Um, but I think, you know, when she figures it out, it's going to be a special, special thing to watch. You mentioned obviously adding, uh, Adam Arbor to the staff. Uh, let's first talk about how strange has it been for you not to have coach Allison habits in your dug. I mean, that's, that has to be even more stranger. I would imagine, uh, for you. How is that? How have you adjusted? Uh, I mean, I'm sure she'll be around and follow the program and everything like that, but she won't be on a day to day there with you next to you. Oh, I know. And, you know, I coached her for four years at Louisiana Lafayette. We were friends for like three years. Then when I got the job, I said, hey, let's go. And she came to Tuscaloosa and 25 years later, it's, it was an unbelievable run. You never have somebody like that stay for 25 years at, a, at the same school. It's unheard of. You know that. Um, just, you know, 
best friends and her family adopted me when I was in Louisiana. She's known my family, you know, for 34 years. So it was a shock to the system for sure. But, you know, as a head coach, you always, you embrace change because it's always going to happen. You always remember that the best is going to come. And, you know, Caleb Rowe was, uh, you know, three-time All-American for us, um, was an outfielder under Allie, one of the best hitters we've ever had in our the history of our program. And she was doing great things on ESPN, the SEC Network. And she was working also for the Seattle Mariners this summer and um, called her up and said, how about coming back to Tuscaloosa? And uh, it was a little harder to recruit her this time than the first time. Uh, she's married to a great guy named David Bernie, uh, daughter, Dylan, a two-year-old, uh, just a great family. And I think the more they thought about it and the more, you know, they talked to people here, it just seemed like a really, really good fit. So obviously we're going to miss Allie, but um, just as excited to have bro bring, you know, different energy, different ideas. And we're going to embrace that change. She, we, we had Kayla on when she took the job, and she said when she talked to Coach Habits many years ago, she said the one job she would leave broadcasting for was this job, the Alabama job. And she said the thing that, would, that closed the deal was when you told her personally that bring, bring your family, bring your kids to the games and the ballpark, that they're welcome in there. That meant a lot to her. Just talk about that, that family environment. Uh, and, and was that, from your standpoint, what was you know, getting Kayla back? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, staff had Julian, her son, um, and he kind of grew up around the ballpark. But Dylan already knows she's two years old and she knows everybody's name. Like she'll come into the clubhouse and she'll wave at one of the players and say the name of the player like they're best friends. And, you know, almost every day when she gets out of school, uh, David and her come to practice and they sit up in the stands and Everybody yells at her and him and him and she'll wave. And then after practice is over, here she comes down on the diamond. She's running the bases and, you know, taking swings in the cage. She's already got a good left-handed swing. So um, it just was this, you know, and um, she's going to be around our, our young ladies, but our young ladies are going to see her grow up too. And it's one of the coolest things I think that can happen. Um, just that, that interaction between a young kid who is looking up to our players and just to see them both grow in a four year span is going to be cool. One of the things Kayla told me too, that she hopes as she settles in there on the staff, that one of the things she hopes to contribute to is get some of the speed back on Alabama's offense, you know, kind of like that was when she played on those teams as well. And maybe more of the slapping game and teaching the game of slapping that she feels is lacking at times in the game today. Just talk about what you envision her role to be uh, moving forward. I mean, she is goat coaching for the first time, and there's a learning curve there, but what's kind of her role on that? I know she'll be coaching the outfielders, I would assume, considering she's arguably right there with McClenny as the best outfielders in program history. Yeah, she'll coach first base, do all the outfield, do all the left-hand clapping, short game, bunting, uh, base running. Uh, she was also, you know, one of our base, best base runners ever. Um, but right now, I think we have seven green light girls on the team. Uh, I think the best thing that um, that could have happened to Christian White was Caleb Rowe as a coach, uh, center fielder, you know, um, lefty, lefty. So that combination is going to work really, really well together. Uh, and then the other thing that I think a lot of people didn't realize that she brings a competitive edge that not many people could see from watching her on the field but in the dugout in the clubhouse in the locker room you could see it and you could hear it and you could feel it and i think our kids have already have already felt that and it's a good thing does that and that's something you bring i mean they know her credentials i would assume i mean she's been around the probe she's done your games but they now they see her on the wall that has to that, that's an impact that honestly you can't make that impact on a player only she can do that because of her cr credentials yeah you know we 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 try to include our alums a lot. And, you know, one of the coolest things about our program is I, I know everybody that played here because I've been here since day one. So if I have a story about a kid, all I got to do is call her and say, Hey, I'm going to tell your story, but I'm going to put you on a zoom. And as soon as I'm done with the story, I'm going to unmute the, 
the overhead projector and you're going to be on the computer screen in front of everybody to tell your side of the story. And our girls love that. And bro was one of those kids, you know, like when she'd come back uh, to do a softball game before the TV uh, coverage, she would come into the clubhouse and talk to the team about when she played or, you know, whatever. And, um, you know, one of the uh, kids told us during their um, exit interview for the fall was that's one of their most favorite things when we bring in an alum to talk about what it was like when they played or maybe a story or whatever. And they enjoy hearing those things. And bro was one of the best storytellers we've had. That doesn't surprise me. Having talked to her many, many a times on the show, that makes a ton of sense. This is also, you're, you're quietly have a nice coaching tree you're building up there. Like I, it's kind of under the radar, but you're talking, I mean, you got Charlotte Morgan who did a great, doing a great job at CSUN, got into the postseason last year. You know, Van Brakel now starting up at Memphis. You got Lacey Bridge. I mean, I'm missing people here, but just talk about this coaching tree there that you're quietly building. And that's, and I'm not even including people that have t come on the show and they've said, one of the people that I lean to for advice is coach Murphy, even though I didn't play for him or coach under, but he's someone that's always open. And just talk about that part of it, that you help out other coaches get in the game. And now you've got former players and people that have worked on your staff uh, coaching elsewhere. Uh, Molly Fickner, too, at Louisiana yeah. Monroe. Kelsey Dunn at yeah. Embry Road. You know, I have two former managers. One's at Wallace Hansfield's the head coach, uh, Carson Owens. And then A.J. Dordery is the head coach at UAB, 45 minutes down the road. So uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, one of the th questions they're going to ask all the past presidents, too, about, you know, the NFCA and growing the game. Um, and I'll tell you the story. Uh, when I was probably 24, I went to a convention in Fort Lauderdale and it was one of the first times I'd gone. Annie Ved Gerard was the head coach and she was my mentor. And I was just like a little puppy dog because I didn't know anybody. And I stayed right behind her. And, you know, she introduced me to everybody. And we went to dinner one night and um the people at the table, every single one of them eventually got into the Hall of Fame of the NFCA, every one of them at the table. And we were leaving the restaurant and Linda Wells was one of them, um, was at Minnesota and Arizona State. And the conversation came up. I had never seen the ocean. I'm an Iowa boy, nowhere near the ocean, right? And she looked at me and she goes, what? You've never seen the ocean? And I said, no, ma'am, <laughs> never been in the ocean, never seen an ocean. And she goes, we're going. So Fort Lauderdale, and it was like three blocks away. And we walked straight to the ocean. And she said, take your shoes and socks off. And I literally rolled up my pants and we walked into the ocean. And here's Linda Wells, who's a Hall of Famer, probably 10 times over with a kid from Iowa that she has no business being nice to. And she was. And uh, I re I'll remember that until the day I die, where all these um, women at the this restaurant, eventual Hall of Famers, did anything and everything to make this young kid from Iowa feel welcomed. And they did that. And I just try to pay it forward because I, I was the benefactor of all those good relationships when I was 23, 24 and 25. And I learned so many things from so many people at that age that it I don't know, I just feel like I, I need to pay it forward. You have, and I think a lot of people appreciate that. A couple last things before we let you go. Schedule's out, another challenging schedule. You're going to start the season on the road uh, in Atlanta, hosted by Georgia Tech, with Villanova's in there and Georgia Tech's in there, among others. You've got Arizona coming to the Roadhouse. Got, uh, you got the SEC slate. What I'm curious about, this is obviously next year the SEC will grow with Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, I know you're still trying to all finalize how that schedule is going to look like. Well, how is that going to impact your non-conference scheduling moving forward? I don't think anything. Because okay. we're still gonna still gonna play eight opponents, and you know what they do? It's all computerized, and they throw all the schools in the computer, and you know you play eight teams, and like this year, um, we won't have fifteen; it'll be thirteen. So you have twelve teams to choose from. You play eight out of the twelve, so there's four schools that you don't play, right? So the next year, you automatically play those four, and then randomly they pick another four. So you get four, four schools that drop off and eight stay. So when Texas and Oklahoma come in, now it's going to be 14. So you won't play six. 
So you'll pick eight and six will go off. The next year you'll play those six and you'll have two randoms come on. It'll still be four home, four away, regardless, you know, um, still have the tournament. Um, but I think the um, there's going to be some years where, you know, I think that's probably what you're alluding to. You will have one hell of a SEC schedule and you're going to be like, oh, my God, I have all these schools and it's going to be a tough road. But that's kind of what the SEC is right now. So it's just going to make it a little tougher. And the SEC tournament still will rotate like has been no adjustments there. Uh, it's it's on a uh, rotation alphabetical. This year, Georgia next year, but we have had some conversations with a neutral site, uh, kind of like a Hoover for SEC baseball sure. or the Hall of Fame Stadium for Big 12 softball. Yeah. Um, there's some people that have actively asked the SEC, can we host your tournament? And my opinion is give them an opportunity to do that. And what can they do for our sport? Because I think it would grow even more. Yeah, I know that's been something that's been suggested with the success that baseball's had at Hoover, like you mentioned, in the SEC. That has been talked about in the past, so that's interesting. It'll be interesting to see how that follows. We'll follow that uh, as time goes. I will I'd be remiss. This is coming up this season will be the 10th season of your radio voice, Tom Canterbury, a good friend of the show. Obviously, the host co-host of Out of the Box with Gray Robertson. Both of them just won this past year. They won the Golden Mike for best softball radio broadcast team in the country. Just speak to that, because you came from the media relations side. So you know what the radio broadcast means to a program. So I want you to put in the words what a Tom Canterbury has meant to you, what a Gray Roberts and that crew has meant to you, one of the best in the country. And, and you know, for Tom, his 10th season. Well, first, I went home for Thanksgiving, and I'm from Iowa. And we got to see a couple of the uh, aunts and uncles that I don't get to see a lot. Um. And we sit down at a restaurant and right away, um, my aunt uh, says, I sure do appreciate Tom and Gray because we don't get the SEC network where we live. I mean, right off the bat, I didn't even say a word about softball, but she brought it up to me. And I have, you know, I'm from Iowa and I have a lot of friends and family still around the entire state. And that's probably one of the first things they all mention is Tom and Gray. And, you know, the bought in factor for a radio team, especially for, you know, an Olympic sport like softball is huge. Both of them are 100 percent bought in to the sport of softball. They don't have one foot in and one foot out trying to get somewhere else, you know, and you've seen it. I've seen it. Uh, they don't do a very good job if they're like that. You know, um, they're not in it for a paycheck. They do it because they love the sport. Absolutely love the sport. So it is a, a benefit for us that they do love the sport because the listeners at home, they can feel it when they listen to them. And, um, you know, I can't thank them enough for what they do because they do do a lot for us and the sport. And obviously they've grown it to a podcast and um, they're just really good guys as well. No doubt, and very talented. I know Gray does a lot of the SEC Network Plus games uh, when it's brought produced by the school, and you've had some of the former players pop in there with Tom. Uh, I think Tal did some games and got great reviews as well. So it's uh, it's pretty cool. Very fortunate there what you got going there with what they've built there, and obviously the the, the history of the broadcasting there. Uh, I don't even think people realize that Chad Haney before that and. JP Shadrick, like not many schools have that history that you have had at Alabama there with the broadcast. I know. And JP was a very, very, very first one. Yeah. And he came and said, I want to do softball on the radio. And he was a college kid. And I was like, how are you going to pay for it? And he says, I'm going to go get the money. And he did. He did it all on his own. And I'm so proud of him. And now he works for the Jacksonville Jag Jaguars. And he's all over the country doing football, college football radio on Saturdays. He is a self-made success. And uh, he started with college softball at the University of Alabama. Yep, I've talked to him about it in the past, which, and I've been in the booth with them, and it's all those guys at one point, which pretty much outed my age and how long I've been around this sport. Uh, well, let you go on this. Obviously, as you get past the holidays, before you know it, you were, the players report in January, season will be there in February in Atlanta. What are a couple keys for this team 
uh, to accomplish your eternal goals or maybe a couple questions you might have that you can only answer once you get into action against other teams? Well, probably number one, can we stay in the strike zone as an offense? That was our Achilles heel last year. We chased too many pitchers' pitches, um, too high, too low, whatever. And we worked really, really hard on that this fall. So if we can stay in the strike zone, I think our hitters are going to be fine. And then probably the the biggest question is who replaces Montana? You know, you, you know, you have a five year starter, a four time All American, arguably the best pitcher in the history of the program. Who steps up? We have six that are very, very capable. And how that synergy goes with that staff is probably going to mirror our success on the field. So if they can, they can be together, uh, they can have Mudita for each other, uh, no jealousy, no envy of success, uh, I think we're going to be fine because I think we're more athletic, uh, we're more offensive. Team defense was great this fall, but uh, I want to see how it gels in the circle. It's going to be uh, tremendous uh, to see the season will get here before you know it around the corner. Uh, Patrick Murphy, Alabama head coach, joining us here on In the Circle. Coach, thank you for uh, always talking to us and everything you do for the game, and uh, always appreciate talking to you, always cherish it. Uh, have a good holidays, and uh, we'll talk to you down the road here during the season. Come up to the Rhodes house, Eric. You're always welcome. <laughs> I appreciate the invite. We'll definitely pick you up on that. Thanks, Coach. Thank you.